<laughs> welcome, welcome to the Bless Sads podcast. <laughs> you know, I just have to say this, that I, I yeah. love it when I get to talk to you, Kim. I know it's kind of yeah. weird to say that, but it gives me energy. What? You know, when you, yeah, it, it does. When I record it this, yeah. That, we well, yeah, I mean, me too. It also makes me tired after, though, because I'm old. It does. You know? But, but you it know. energizes me. Yeah, it's called, so thanks, Kim. It's called joy. Hey, it what's is. up? It is. Cool. It's called Change doing what makes you happy. <laughs> Okay. It's because we like helping people and when we're doing this. We know we are. Yeah. yeah. It helps when you get like, I mean, I get messages probably, I would say several times a week. People mm -hmm. are like, it's changing my life. It's changing my life. And I keep thinking like, I feel like it's just the medicine that's changing your life, but that's not what it is. They say that it's the self-talk, that it's the Ooh, yeah. hearing that it's not their fault, that hearing that they're not alone and, he, and it like helps them unwind it all, you know? Totally. So it's like, even if we don't ever change anything big, like with legislation, maybe we at least helped a little, you know, the whole shame thing, yeah. the shame thing's intense. The shame thing is intense. Yeah. Are you interested in understanding GOP one medications like Ozempic, Wagovi, or Manjaro? Then join us on the plus sides, cracking the obesity code, the groundbreaking podcast, helping people change their lives one episode at a time. The Plus Sides podcast is a disruptor. We're breaking down barriers, smashing stereotypes, and sharing inspiring stories that'll leave you feeling informed and empowered. Join us every week to learn from doctors who are specialists around GLP-1 medications like Ozempic, Wagovia, and Manjaro. They'll provide you with science and facts to validate these incredible stories. But that's not all. We'll also bring you the voices of the GLP-1 Manjaro TikTok community, real people who face the challenges of obesity related diseases and disorders and discovered the incredible plus sides of GLP-1 medications. Our episodes are filled with heartwarming stories, laughter, and moments of triumph. You'll connect with our amazing community members who are reclaiming their health and experiencing their fullest lives. Are you ready to embark on a journey of discovery and empowerment? Tune in to the plus sides cracking the obesity code and together we'll change the narrative around obesity and end the stigma. Subscribe now on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform platform and join our incredible community. Let's celebrate the plus sides of life together because every story deserves to be heard. Every life deserves to shine and everyone deserves access to expert knowledge and medication. The plus sides podcast. You're not alone. Prince obsessed. It, it my, indeed my does. Sweatshirt. I mean, Kat, you are, I you're know. a lot Prince obsessed and this is very common. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> you even have a rug that's Prince. Like my mug. Why Darth? Why why Darth Vader? Is he Darth Prince and I just don't know it? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm bummed. My husband's mug. Oh, okay. My half nice. decaf and regular for the night. Okay. Well, yeah. Anyway. That's probably smart. If I do that, I ain't going to bed. I was talking to Lydia earlier and I was like, if I don't, and she was like, if I have even a drop of coffee after like three, I'll be up all night. I'm the same way. It's bizarre, right? But you're not truly ADHD then, are you? Yes. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yes, I it am. It hits people in all different ways. Girl, let me tell you. I was like this. I'm, I So I was diagnosed when I was a little girl in elementary school. Yeah. And my mom was like, I'm not giving her drugs. She's a child. <laughs> Maybe oh. you should have. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yeah. They put my yeah. niece on Viv was it Vivance when she yeah. was a teenager. Yeah. They had the now. signs were there, though. The signs were there. Yeah. So. Sure. Like we see I mean, it now as adults. Right? I don't know. Part of me thinks that everyone that was born during the age of the internet has ADHD. You know what I'm saying? Have be. you seen TikTok? She had to have always like tissue. She always had to hold tissue. It was a texture thing. Like she a, always had to be twisting just, and fidgeting with something. It's called stimming. She was stimming. That's, yeah. And as we're like regular, regular adults, like, oh, sure. that's just her, her hang up. No, she, she yeah. had the signs. She, she's got, she's got the ADHD. She's got the ADHD. Sorry, Corinne. I put your business out there. I just called ah, her name out. Like, <laughs> and you just did a little more. Wait, what's this? Oh, 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 what's it? Oh, this right here, ladies and gentlemen, this is the way that you can support the podcast. One, you can get a Stanley and have it shaped like a Manjaro muck or zip on. I think there's a zip on one now too, with our coupon Ooh. code plus 10 to get $10 off. Or you can get that one from our merch store, which Kat has abused. I really have. I really have abused this. That is a hot and, mess, Kat. You know, that's one you take to Cycle Bar. So they got, you know, they got new bikes at the Cycle Bar. Yeah. And um, this is the only one that fits. Like, I can't use that Stanley Jeez. anymore. So perfect. See? Where do you think they put the old bikes when they, like, side them? You can sell like, them. When they're like, 
I feel like it, but who would just helped? Like a jankity jump? I don't know, I'm they are so beat to hell, honestly. Yeah, I, I broke saying. three of them. Honestly. Maybe they recycle them and get like a cut. I think they do. They probably take to some like sporting goods, old yeah. gym. Like if it's bad enough good. for you to like change your bikes out, they can't be good. Yeah, that's expensive. Oh, yeah. We, it, we yeah. They were, um yeah. Well, they bought the new bikes used-ish too. So. Oh, okay. Word. But they're okay. super good. We should like anyway, it. Let's get to business. <laughs> So JT's not with us tonight. It's just me and Kat. Sorry, so sorry. Too bad, so sad. But this is how it's going to be. Tonight, we are going to have um, the host, well, plus minus one, of the Waiting Table podcast. So those of you who, who don't know me, I'll tell you real quick. I'm Kim. Hey. And um, I That's had sushi you. today, and it was glorious. And the reason I'm telling you that is because I had lap band surgery in 2007, and this is the first time I, that I have had sushi since not having a lap band. As a matter of fact, I didn't even eat sushi before. And eating sushi with a lap band is tricky business. Really? Yeah. That's it gets stuck. Why? Yeah. What it's, what was the reason? Why was it tricky business? It's just being so clumpy and icky. Like it just Ew. gets I know. It just gets like stuck. Like and it's very uncomfortable and miserable. And one of the reasons like a lot of people hate lap band <laughs> and they're glad to have it removed. So I had mine since 2007. I just got mine removed in November of last year. Uh, and I had sushi today and I eat the shit out of that sushi. <laughs> I made that sushi mug. <laughs> I was like, I put like wasabi all over it. I like went to, I was like, oh, it wasn't like yeah. I overate. I just ate all the sushi in the land and I may not have chewed a lot and I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Okay. You know, I was it like, used to be my oh. jam. I think I overdid it. I'm like, I, I could do sushi, jam. but it used you to be know? my whole entire jam. I loved sushi, sushi for the oh, longest, but yeah. now. Well, now it's, it's okay. now it's the first time I've had it since the surgery. And now I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to have it. More. All the sushis. In the land. Yeah. I agree. Anyway. Good. So back to the point is the waiting table podcast. Yay. So I'm going to invite on a host. We're down one, but you're going to get to meet them. They're going to tell their story. And then they brought another friend with them too, to help validate those stories. with It's facts, a science party. It is a party. I know. It's bariatric, weird. even though I, I feel like I'm still in the Barry family, minus the, I still had one for a long time. You did. You know, you that was one. my life. Yeah. You had one. Yeah. So I still, I'm very, I'm very, very happy it's gone though. <laughs> Here we go. Hey, Rob. Hi, Rob. How, are you, how you doing? Hey, how are you guys? guys? So um, I see you're down somebody. Can you tell us a, bit, a little bit about why? So they won't be like Kim didn't invite him, you know. <laughs> oh, Shay, you're on mute. She oh, doesn't yeah, want to really tell the story. She just wants tell to pretend she cares. Poor, poor Murph, our lost soldier of the oh, night. Yeah. He uh, is sick, so he was really sad that he missed tonight, and he said to say hello. But unfortunately, you're left with just me and Rob, and we're probably the yes, worst out of the you. three. Oh, stop. <laughs> I agree. I I totally well, agree. Rob is at least Rob, Rob, is Rob, Rob. Out of the three of us. Let's be honest here. <laughs> well, this is a safe space, um, much like when I came on your show. Um, you know, I'd love for you guys just to take the wheel and take yeah. the space and tell us your story. So, Rob, um, Shay, do you want to start, or Rob, do you want to start, oh, okay. whoever? Y'all, no, y'all no, pick. No, Shay, Shay, it's Shay can start. They always, they always Jesus have take that the leg Let's up go. on me. They always go ladies first. They always sure. pull that on me yeah. all the time. So I'll Dang. take it. I'll take it in stride. Okay, um, we'll take. <laughs> Perfect. What's up? My name is Shay and I am 29 years old. I had bariatric surgery in March. It'll be my two year anniversary. So um, I've always struggled with the disease of obesity, always just lived in a larger body. Um, but really, it wasn't until um, my husband and I started to try to conceive that I kind of looked into different options to lose weight. And I think very similar to many people who are watching and probably on this podcast right now. Um, I tried all of the diets, all of the um, fads, and nothing ever worked. And it was very frustrating. And um, I ended up getting diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. 
in uh, December of 2020. And then once I got diagnosed with that, I feel like that's really where my journey began, where I started learning more about nutrition, just stuff that I wasn't taught. Like I didn't know, you know, what macros were or, oh, maybe I should be eating, you know, a balanced meal, you know, or several meals throughout the day. And um, I was definitely under eating. And I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions, you know, people who have the disease of obesity, I often find that that is the case where we're not eating enough, because what are we told all of our lives eat less exercise, and then we'll lose weight, which is not how it works. <laughs> and so um, I started just learning more about my body, learning more about hormones. Rob and Murph always love when I get into that portion of having regular cycles and my period, all of that. I'm very open about that, um, which Rob and Murph love. And uh, and so just learning more about my body, because again, I was just not taught that. And so um, it was really frustrating because for about a solid year, I was eating what I needed to to support my body. I was working with a nutritionist to help me with that. I was moving my body and it was like, come on, like, why isn't this working? I still have this excess weight. I wasn't having a regular cycle. And um, it was actually my mother-in-law who had bariatric surgery, who started just kind of telling me a bit more about her journey and experience and um, in a very kind way, not in a judgmental way, but just asked me if that was something that I considered because she saw research um, about how bariatric surgery can really help with conceiving and, and having healthy babies. And so at first I was like, no, like I, you know, had the, the misconception of I'm not like 600 pounds, you know, I don't need to have bariatric surgery. I'm not to that point yet. And then um, the more that I looked into it, I was like, I think this is actually a really good option for me. And so I did a lot of research, figured it was a good choice for me, um, had the surgery done and I'm making it sound like, you know, Bing, bing, really, really quick, but it, it was a long process to kind of get there. Um, and it was something that was the right decision for me. So fast forward, I'm two years post-op now. I have fairly regular cycles, which is really exciting. My hormones have improved a lot. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, you know, there's still some things that I'm kind of working through with that, but I've lost um, just about a um, hundred pounds. So at my highest weight, I was at 283 pounds. Um, I've lost, I got down to 183 and then I've gained a little bit back since then. Um, but my life is just really different. And I, I think sometimes it's easy to look at people who've lost a lot of weight and think, oh, they just feel good about themselves now because they've lost the weight. And I really try to be careful when I'm sharing my story that, having weight loss surgery didn't make me worthy or didn't make me a good person because I lost weight. It was really just the catalyst to do a lot of self-discovery, a lot of learning about myself. And I'm just a happier and healthier person than I was when I started my journey. So that's just a little bit about me. That's amazing. Thank that's you. Awesome. I love that. Um, I think that you make such a good point. I you know, I look back on like, um, kind of like who I am now. I'm telling you, I've, I've always been like this. Like I, yes. I, I'm, I've always been, I've always been big personality, kind of crazy. I think for me, like the, like we talk about, so like on my end, like I had surgery, right. But I, but then I've, I've been on GLP once and, um, they, I think just, there was a realization for me, um, of taking them where I realized it wasn't my fault. So what they've done is been mm -hmm. able to be like, forgive myself, but yes. I never, I never hated myself or any of the other things I didn't like about myself. Mm -hmm. But like my mom was the ultimate hype girl and we had our stuff, we had our diet culture stuff, but my mom was like, you will not talk about yourself like that. that, is that is, so nobody talks about my baby like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that that is, um, one of the biggest reasons that I'm like, I don't know, still standing. Cause like this world will beat you down pretty good when you yeah. are overweight, especially as a child. You know, yes, but well, and, yeah. and that shame piece you both yeah. spoke of a shame while piece. ago, it's it's like untangling that and going, where did that come from? Why yeah. is that there? It's it's a journey, it's a process, but that's yeah, my biggest message. I always try to share with people like you're loved, you're worthy, and it doesn't matter what yeah. size you are, it doesn't none of that matters. It matters right. just that it is. So yeah. I think um I'm I'm wondering if you're open to a couple questions. Is that okay? Of course. Yeah, I'm a very open book. So feel yeah. free to ask away. I have one comment I want to say. Go to away. 
No, I'm just kidding. I would do like all of the. What plays. do you think? You got a podcast or something? I know. <laughs> all, the plays, all the hats off to you, Shay, to have it so much more figured out than I did at 27. So, right. <laughs> yeah. <hats off. laughs> I was sitting here listening well, to your story like, this is amazing. So. Thank you. Well, and that's the thing. Like, I didn't know that obesity was a disease until yeah. I was actually into the process of getting or getting stuff prepared for bariatric surgery. Yeah. And, and I kind of was like, well, I could keep trying to do what I've been doing and it just hasn't been working yeah. or I can do this younger. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and so it, when I was kind of coming into this space and part of why I started sharing my story is I didn't really see a lot of people who were my age getting the surgery and like yeah. what the outcomes mm -hmm. were. And there's a lot more that have come up since, yeah. you know, when I started looking into it, but, um, I'm so thankful and glad that I got it done earlier on in life. Not saying that there's, you know, I have people in the community who are 60 years old when they get the surgery done. And so there's not, yeah. you know, yeah. obviously talk with your doctor to see if it's a good choice, but sure. um, I'm really thankful it was the right choice for me. Great. Yeah. Yep. That's awesome. My hat's off. Um, did you, at the time when you were considering like the different ways to treat obesity and you were learning about it, did you consider anything other than surgery, like taking um, a GLP? No, it was, that wasn't ever something that was recommended. I didn't know anything about it. It was honestly until we had our podcast with you, Kim, when you came on that I learned a lot just from that time yeah. where I just didn't know much about it before then. And so um, I did get diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. You were much in your ADD, ADHD. <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, that did help with more of like my binging tendencies when I got diagnosed and I've been on medication for that for a while, but that was the only other treatment option. And that's not you know, necessarily a yeah. treatment option for obesity, but, um, definitely with the binge eating disorder, it helped me with that. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, my doctor was really great and, and wasn't one of the doctors who was condemning or said, Oh, if you just eat less and lose weight, like she understood the complexities of it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but I think it's only honestly been in the last few years that I think it's becoming more, um, in, it's, there's more education being shared within the clinical space to where more options are being presented. And it just, those weren't presented to me at the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Like, cause you know, Victoza Saxenda, Mara mentioned on your podcast has been around a long time. Mm -hmm. I get lost its patent last year. So mm -hmm. I think it's interesting. Like nobody ever told me about it either. Mm -hmm. And I, I was your age when I had, when I had lab band, mm -hmm. uh, wait a minute, phrase. I was 27. That's what you were when you had Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I had that, I for, did it for very similar reasons, right? Like I wanted to have family, want to lose weight, want to, want to try to get ahead of it. So I wasn't mm -hmm. 60 and doing it and that kind of thing. And, and, um, and it helped me quite a bit. It never regulated my cycles, but it helped me quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, but I wish that someone had told me when I was 27 and I went to talk to him about surgery, he'd like, would you like to try a GLP for a minute? Like, mm -hmm. I wish that someone had said that because I mean, honestly, it could have been that I had done that. And then eventually I was like, guys, I might still have sleep in the future. Like I have a chronic mm -hmm. disease that continues mm -hmm. to reoccur. Like I'm not throwing anything out, you mm -hmm. know, like mm -hmm. it's whatever is the right tool, like kind of at the right time. You know what I mean? And, but just knowing the options, right? That's yeah, what sucks. I think with a lot of our stories is that we weren't given like clear cut options of yeah. these are all the mm -hmm. options to choose from what yeah. feels right. And having that conversation, which is a yeah. bummer, but that's why. Mm -hmm. Talking about it in these settings, like, oh, is yeah. so important, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I think it's important, too. Like, there are so many people that have PCOS that have taken these medications mm -hmm. and been able to regulate their cycles and then hopefully conceive. So especially for young women out there, if you are listening, I've been seeing more and more people, like, in their mm -hmm. 20s engage with my content. You know, yes. just, like, don't wait. Like, get mm -hmm. tested and get your levels tested. Like, that's, you know, Sherman's will usually cover that just to see what's going on. Yeah. And, um, figure out what's going on. And, and, you know, if you have weight issues with obesity, talk to your doctor about using a GLP, you know, yeah. because I think that if I had known I might have more children, I really wanted more children. Mm -hmm. Like I had two mm -hmm. miscarriages and then I had my son and he was my miracle baby, but I love being a mother. Mm -hmm. I love, like I get upset when I think about it. Cause it feels like this mm -hmm. is an opportunity. If someone had just like, frankly, just fucking told me, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. and that, that just bothers me because I didn't know enough to ask. Yeah. You know, so I just, if anybody's listening, the podcast has grown considerably recently. So if you're listening, like just, just go ask, advocate mm -hmm. for help because it could make all the difference in the world. You yes. Know? Because and as women, we only have so long. Yes. You know? 
And please reach out. Like I, I love engaging with people on my platform. So if you have any questions, obviously I'm not a doctor, I'm not a clinician, but if you need help in like what avenues do I kind of start trying to go down? I share a lot on my YouTube channel about like my story and more specifics to PCOS and whatnot. But I think that's what was so hard is like when I got the diagnosis, I didn't really know anybody who had it. And so it's like, what do you do? You go to the internet and you start looking and trying to find somebody who has a comparable story. And so anybody who's listening, who got diagnosed or who needs support, please reach out because (laughs) I can feel really lonely and that sucks, but you're not alone. You're not. Nope. 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 No, that's our whole thing. Not alone. It's such a fault. So we'll Mm -hmm. make sure we include um, the link to Shay's socials and Rob's as well uh, so that you guys can can go and follow them because it's awesome. Surgery or no surgery, like yes, with the same disease that we all deal with. So, Mm -hmm. and that's something too, like I always, I love getting to meet new people, whether you struggle with the disease of obesity or not, whether you've had surgery or not, like people are people. I love people. And so don't feel like because you haven't had surgery or that's not something you're considering that you can't hang out with them. I love everybody. So you're the best. Thank you. <laughs> That's the all right. I part guess we'll talk too, to Rob right? now that we've put all the lady parts away. <laughs> right. No. Yeah. So we're opposite in that I do not like people. So we're just totally. Just <laughs> That's okay. Uh, That's a good way to start it <laughs> off. Yeah. Right. All right. You know, it's okay all right. to be honest. Um, it's a safe space. <laughs> also, I, I always forget that, you know, if, if we let Shay go first, then we also have to explain that she's 27 and we're older I'm so 29 we always... now i'm 29 i'm almost 30. you're you're all grown up i'm proud of you <laughs> love love the you 20s don't have to you chaperone know? anymore it's like... <laughs> almost almost yeah. it's like bring your kid to podcast day i love it <laughs> <laughs> as i drink out of my old darth vader cup i just make I, sure I have a i have a descendant it. sippy cup so okay. we're good <laughs> oh nice yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Rob Raffinan. I am one of the hosts of The Waiting Table. Um, Yeah, I am 40 years old. Uh, I live in Canada. And I had bariatric surgery. I had RNY. Um, It'll be four years, actually, in September this year. And so um, loving every moment of this. This has been an amazing adventure for me. Um, I try to utilize sort of my experience in a lot of different ways. So um, you know, I do a lot of group training, whether it's cycling, whether it's uh, group run, uh, running groups, whether it's circuit groups, just to try to promote healthy living moving forward now. Uh, I'm also a peer mentor at uh, the UHN or Un- uh, University Health Network in Toronto, um, where I had my surgery. And so, yeah, and and I think that the um, the podcast, the waiting table, is just an extension of sort of the collective experiences that we've had that we would like to share with people. Because when I had my surgery, I knew no one in real life who had had bariatric surgery, and it was very very difficult for me to um, connect with anyone or see myself in anyone, um, namely a younger male, uh, Asian descent, um, having bariatric surgery because young males don't really talk about having bariatric surgery. Asians don't often have bariatric surgery, let alone talk about it. And that's like a double X for for Asian men. And so that was a big part of the idea of of sort of having the waiting table is to really be able to um, provide information and allow others to sort of see themselves in other people um, and and be able to to learn and share those shared experiences. So it was really important for me. Um, I started my journey at about 380 pounds. Um, That was the largest sort of recorded number. I'm pretty sure I went over 400. Um, And uh, yeah, it it was just such a great experience. Uh, I think the most important thing for me was, was really the mindset and, and having a gratitude mindset and being very thankful for everything because life was hard as a big person, as we all know, right? I look back at it now. And, and, you know, the reason I had this surgery was because I had to go on long term disability because I have chronic back issues. And I injured myself and I was forced to take long term disability. And for me, the hardest thing was being able to not support my family. So I have two kids. Uh, I have a daughter who is nine. I have a son who's turning seven in in a couple weeks. And I always called myself or considered myself a present but absentee father. I was there, 
but I wasn't right. Like I was physically there, but I couldn't do much. And when I was there, I was preoccupied with pain, with being unhappy, with hiding my unhappiness. And oftentimes my kids were the ones who got the brunt of that. Right. And my loved ones, my wife, for example. And so, you know, it's not a fun or easy life to go through or an existence to go through where you sort of make it day by day. You don't look at the future because all you're thinking about is the pain that you're in right now. And what do you have look to look forward to? Right. And so I ended up having an intervention. Uh, so a lot of my neighbors actually had an intervention with me where, you know, they expressed how concerned they were because we, we have a very close uh, street and, you know, me not being able to move, uh, being in a wheelchair sometimes, being uh, walking with a cane at, you know, 37, um, and me constantly being in pain, uh, you know, they really wanted to help me sort of move forward and, and, and get control of my health back. And um, that was a, a great way to start. And, and though it didn't um, equate to all the change, it really was the thing that started everything off. And, and so with with the people on my street, we ended up starting a cycling club um, because I had asked them, I, you know, I can't walk, but if I buy a bike, will you bike with me? And they said, anytime you ask. And we ended up biking uh, pretty much every day for the first two months. And then it was winter time. And I had the idea of possibly joining a gym with virtual virtual cycling. And they were just like, OK, let's join a gym. And so we did that every day. And um, I had lost about 80 pounds at that point uh, on my own, just doing that and looking at a moderate lifestyle in regards to diet and you know, everything was going great. And I was at the point now where I was just like, you know, I don't need this surgery. I'm good. Right. I, I could do this now. Uh, and then my mom passed. And so my mom died when she was in her mid, early to mid 60s. My dad had died when he was in his early 60s. And um, I was having a conversation with my wife and and we had the realization that when my parents were my age, they didn't have the comorbidities that I had, right? I was on 15 def different medications. I was on, um, I had high blood pressure. I was um, pre-diabetic. I had high cholesterol. I had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I had severe sleep apnea. I was on numerous different pain meds because of my herniated discs in my back. Um, I was on, I was, I was a mess. And so knowing that my parents didn't have any of those comorbidities, we know there's a correlation, right? It, it's not, it's not like, you know, after you turn 37, everything gets better and better, right? And so, you know, I said, if my parents died early 60s, and I'm 37, and I have all these things going wrong, how much time do I actually have left, right? And I was thinking, you know, we did some napkin, napkin math, and I was just like, okay, so, you know, with the math, maybe I have like 20 years at this point. And how many more years do my kids want to spend time with me? You know, they're young, but then they're going to be teens. And then they're going to be like, yeah, I'm not going to hang out with dad. He's not cool, though. I'm pretty cool. And, um, you know, so I was just like, I have maybe five, six, seven years with my kids. And I've already wasted about six of them because, again, I haven't been able to do anything with them. Um, and so that was at the point where I was just like, you know, where I was sort of teeter tottering on whether I was going to have the surgery that I decided, yes, I'm having the surgery because it's not even about losing the weight. It's about keeping it off and maintaining this lifestyle for my kids and for my family. Um, and so that's what I did. I had the surgery and I sort of just went with it and, you know, I started and, and the whole idea for me was that mindset, the whole idea that be grateful for what you have, be grateful for the journey and the opportunity you have to get your life back. Um, and my wife even, I think it was like six months in, she was just like, you've lost 100 pounds numerous times and gained it all back. And you hated every single day of your life because you were dieting and you didn't like the food and you were exercising. She was like, six months in, you haven't complained once. Why? And I said, I know what I'm fighting for. I know I have a reason why I'm doing everything. And my approach to it was all under the understanding that I was just grateful for this opportunity to get better. Um, and so, yeah, everything has, has gone so well. I also take this opportunity to challenge myself every year because I haven't been able to do so much. I missed my thirties. Right. And so, um, a lot of it is with physical activity 
first year was like, okay, I'm going to do a triathlon. So I did a triathlon. And the second year, it was just like, okay, well, I play pickleball. I'm just like, I'm going to learn pickleball and get really good. And I'm going to start competing. And I uh, won um, bronze at the provincials, which is like your state level. Right. And then this year, I'm just like, okay, well, what else can I do? And so this year, I, I'm um, competing in a transformation bodybuilding competition in June. Um, and for me, like, again, it comes down to why we do the podcast. It's, it's because when I was going through that, when I was at that point where I was just like, I don't know what to do, it would have been great for me to see this person, me now, and be like, holy shit, if that guy can do that, like, I can do that. And the amount of people, and this is, you know, at the JBY Awards and through numerous other avenues, the amount of people who have contacted me and talked to me about how what I'm doing has really motivated them to try to do something different, that's with bariatric surgery or not, has been overwhelming. And I think there's so much power with us selling, shell, uh, sharing our stories with everyone. So whether it's with us, whether it's you guys, you know, I, I really do commend everything that we are doing and sharing this. And my always my key takeaway when it comes to bariatric surgery is at some point it can't be about the number, right? You know, obviously that's what we look at at first. That's the metric. But I think the thing that's always kept me going and made this easy for me, because I can't say that this has been super, super hard. Like, Obviously, have there been challenges? Yes. But I've always maintained that the goal for bariatric surgery should be, or at least it was for me, happiness. Because will that lower number make me happy? Sure. Will being able to play with my kids make me happy? Sure. All these little things can lead to your happiness. But I don't want that number that changes with the amount of carbs I eat or the amount of salt I eat or the amount of water I eat and can fluctuate, not even daily, but hourly to dictate my health or sorry, my happiness. I want the way I feel to dictate the relationships I've built, my impact on the world to impact my happiness. And so I, I just think that we all have such a great opportunity that we're given um, to sort of get our lives back. And so always happy to share this with us, with everyone. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I'm definitely of that mind too, but I wouldn't say I always was. Um, I feel like when I started, all of the time, whenever I did anything, whenever I had the lap band surgery or the medicine, I, I legitimately was like, I just need to lose weight. I just sure. need to lose weight. I just, I couldn't yeah. even think past that because mm -hmm. none of it really seemed possible mm -hmm. uh, because I had never really accomplished it before. So mm -hmm. it was really yeah. difficult. So it would have been great if I had like seen someone like you. So I love that you're doing what you're doing because I do think that's really helpful. Um, I can tell you in terms of like what happened with your back and I probably have a different thing, but I don't think anybody understands how bad back pain is. Mm -hmm. And I have hurt many, many things. I have never had when I hurt my back and then I had to get like, um, freaking nerve blocks and all these different things yep. like that. I was such a jerk. I was not yeah. a good wife. I was not a good friend. I was not a good mother. I mm -hmm. just, it's like you said, all I could think about was the pain, yeah. you know, and it is, it is. And honestly, Oddly enough, that is how I ended up on GOPs. I went yeah. and tried to get my back in a better situation so I could start moving again and then ended up taking GLPs because I went and like bit the bullet, if you will, and, sure. you know, got all the blood work done and saw my doctor and then I didn't want to. And, you know, yeah. and all of that kind of changed. It's interesting because like if you can't move, you know, it does make you just want to give up on all the things, you know, yep. even the things that you can try to be present for. So I just I don't think I hope nobody ever has to feel. Oh, I know. <laughs> like For even work. the people who are my like worst enemies, which aren't, it doesn't exist. I would never want anybody to feel mm -hmm. that it's awful. And I've had plenty of things like, yeah, lots of pain, like an uh, ingrown toenail, even it's like a second is a second. Back pain. <laughs> it's it's, it's up there. Okay? It's up there. I'm telling you. <laughs> well, you got to use your feet a lot. So it's probably, True. yeah, pretty painful. Yeah. When you did the, um, when you were saying you started doing the like virtual cycle, um, was that like with Peloton or did you guys have something different? So it's similar to Peloton. So it wasn't as much of a class. It was sort of like, you know how in gyms they used to have like the spin bikes and then they'd have a big screen yeah. and then you'd choose something. And it's yeah. like riding yeah. on a road. So mm -hmm. we would go and 
there was a whole bunch of us. There's like, man, like four or five of us. And we would take over that area. But then we would start meeting people who were just like, oh, what are you guys doing? And then we ended up having big groups of like 10, 15 people who would just come to ride with us. And we'd be the ones sort of like in the middle of the gym yelling to encourage each other to just keep going. And I have pictures of us when we first started it. And when I was, you know, at this point, I was still like 300 and, you know, 50, 60, 70 pounds at this point. And it was just so awesome to see how supportive everyone was for everyone uh taking part and so i that's the only reason i'm still at that mm-hmm. gym i don't even we don't even have those cycle those bikes anymore uh, but i still i still go because like everyone's so supportive so it's and, quite a community yeah i'm a cycle bar um fanatic i'm sure you have cycle bars in toronto right yeah in toronto? for sure yeah. oh yeah, yeah it, it is great. great i love yeah. it we started actually so a big part of it was like once I had the surgery and my main thing was like, can I get back to cycling? And so we got to the point where we were cycling uh, every weekend. We do like a hundred kilometers every day after work, 30 to 50 kilometers. And it was just like our thing. And and luckily, you know, good and bads to COVID is one thing. It gave us the ability to do that and, and to commit that time to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the bad part is, as we know, with bariatric surgery, you can't eat a lot. Right. And so energy was also a concern, but muscle loss was a big concern. So I look back at what I looked like back then when I, all I was doing is cycling and I, in my head back then, I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'm, I lost all this weight. I'm 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 skinnier. I'm strong. I'm good. And I was full out skin and bones, like mm-hmm. literally skin and bones. And wow. so that's that was one big reason why, like for me, weight training and putting on muscle and the yeah. importance of muscle mass is so it's so big for me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I gotta have my profi before I go ride. There you <laughs> so go. Profi time. <laughs> I have to, yeah, I get it. I have to wait for it at home because cycle bar is expensive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there are. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. Cat cat is her they're her non-negotiables, her cycle bear. She's like, even with doing the podcast, she's like, I don't think you understand. I am unavailable. <laughs> for I'm unavailable yeah. between 9 30 and 10 30 a.m. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I heard okay. that your husband on one of the other episodes that your husband will kind of give you a like you probably need to go work out. I heard you say that oh, that yeah. like if you're getting kind <laughs> of like like oh you haven't been in a little while and you're kind of getting cranky. <laughs> getting cranky. You need to go work out. Leave me That's alone. awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Well, it's so cool. Like I just I to have you guys here and be able to share stories. I think I really really wanted people to see is like these intersections and these commonalities, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, That this disease can be treated and luckily we have good ways now, right? And what I'd like to do is invite on a guest that you guys brought um, and ask him to talk about these ways and how they're different Mm -hmm. and how they're alike. And we can all learn together and maybe uh, grow some too. Hmm? Hello. How are you, Dr. Friedley? I'm good. Hello. We're so glad to have you here. I saw you wave your hand about back pain, so you um, (laughs) went through it it too. Oh, yes. Uh, I have several slip discs and, uh, um, you know, standing and operating for several hours a day definitely plays a role in it. Actually, today I went to the chiropractor and got adjusted. Helps me kind of maintain I just left my chiropractic appointment. I always do yesterday. Yeah. And now I need to stop skipping it. So Yeah, I need to reschedule. I haven't gone in a while. Really since all the lap band stuff. And I feel it. My neck is like, <laughs> like <laughs> gotta go and get that thing they do where you feel like you're like just died, but then you're like, I realize oh God, that you're alive so again. Then you're reborn. Yeah, so you're good. like, wait a second. <laughs> oh, it feels so good. I love it. Yes. My <laughs> chiropractor is like, you're nuts. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie that one of my favorite like guilty pleasures is watching people that are getting an adjustment and fart <sighs> on the internet. Like I. Ooh, that's very I specific. And All fart. right. Also, oh, yeah. Also. Well, not I just also, crack. No. Crack and fart. I have <laughs> an 11 year old boy. Yeah, at least the guess, it's his right? fault. <laughs> It's his fault. He, he, I'm telling you, I, I blame him. 11 year old boys. There's nothing more funny than farts. Okay. So, dinosaur monkey so, farts. True. Yeah. That's why my name is Dinosaur Monkey Farts because the 11 year old, mm-hmm. but he wasn't 11 at the time. But still to this day, farts. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I'll send you clips later. <laughs> it's true. All of our conversations usually like come to farts, poop, or, like, yeah. Uh, if sure, it's not, yeah, periods. Yeah. Period. We, all of it. Cycles. Functions. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> 
Um, Sounds like well, the Dr. Dr. Yeah, Kennedy, exactly. If you, could, um, if you could tell us a little bit about who you are and how you help people, that would be great. Uh, I'm Dr. Fridley. I'm with uh, I'm the owner of Surgical Associates of Bayonet Point, and I'm a general and bariatric surgeon. So I perform a lot of the surgeries that you guys are talking about. And um, that's the biggest way I think I help. But also, I think that having a good understanding of my patients and knowing that it's not just the surgery, that that's the smallest piece of all of it. And just being kind of a, um, a very versatile and, and put myself out there so that people know that we have in, in our practice, we basically, it's the whole patient is what's important. So that's, that's been our focus at Surgical Associates. So speaking of surgery versus GLP, um, on our podcast, we explore this a lot with obesity specialists, endocrinologists, and bariatric surgeons, like specifically. Um, we go, we, we go into everything. We talk to dietitians, cognitive behavioral therapists, like all these different things. Um, but that being said, one surgeon that was on our show the first season said, you know, that, and this, and, and a lot of people with, we're in season three now. So a lot of people may not know. But he was sort of explaining about how they discovered like GLP and sort of the power of it um, and how it was affected in surgery and how sort of the idea of that is how these medications were sort of reverse engineered and born. And I think it will be really cool if you could talk with us about that. I mean, from basic extent, we've known about GLP ones for about 15 years um, before they were ever out for, you know, pharmaceutical studies, but it's, it's been of our knowledge to know what GLP-1 did and what that receptor did. And, you know, there's PYY, there's poly, there's so many, CCK, there's so many that go into that, which we didn't know anything about until the early 50s when it was post-World War II and we started to actually do a little bit more about nutrition. And we were doing a lot of um, actually feline studies and um and um, canine studies that basically started to boost up and start to understand the, the digestive system a little bit more. And that's when we started kind of digging into these different hormones playing a role. And even with our mice, um, good old OB1 um, is the most, most famous mouse there is, I think, in the obesity community, community, not just because he's the, you know, the connections with Star Wars, but um, close to close to Mickey Mouse. I feel like right. those are pretty close, you know, so it was it was 15 years ago that we actually identified these <laughs> hormones, but then being able to synthesize uh, a analog or peptide close to it and then analyze what that was doing. And we're even digging into um, I think there's a different class that's going to be coming or it's already out, but it's getting um trials now and that's very similar to like the gila monster it's the venom mm -hmm. of a gila monster is basically what that does and it has the same exact yeah. effect as uh gop1 agonist wow. so it's 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 been for a while yeah um, i can't say that surgery was the one who brought it to light it, this has been in the background for decades mm. that's fascinating fascinating so you said post world war ii so you're like in the 50s 50s when, and 60s or 50s when, yeah when we Early started getting nutrition we started and, yeah so yeah, about we have a lot of equations that they use in the, a lot of equations they use in nutrition for calculating your basal metabolic rate and where that all came from is a surplus of gis that we had after world war ii uh, we started locking them in rooms and doing uh calorics to basically see how much energy just to sit there and do nothing how much would it increase the temperature of the room uh it's quite fascinating. Yeah. That's that really interesting. Very. I learned something. Well, I learned I learned more than just something new every every podcast episode. Yeah. We learned so yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is it too late to go back to school for Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah. Although I would suck. I like all I do is like like what I do for a living, y'all that don't mean real world, is I take very complicated things and I try to make them like digestible. Right. Like this is what it means really like, you know, to somebody who's not a medical professional, which is really just what I do on the podcast. You know what I mean? So I, it's the same thing <laughs> because there's so many people like me, but we don't, we don't, we don't speak that language, you know? So we need, we need help. <laughs> so yeah. So thank you for that. Go ahead, Kat. Cool. Sorry. 
Oh, you're fine. Um, so this is the, th these are the things that I think about. What sort of bariatric surgeries do you do that are non-surgical? I just said bariatric surgery, non-surgical. Non is that really a term? Or It's a, it's a sure. very gray area. It is. I think anything that requires, you know, a surgery. specialist, it's, yeah. you know. Surgery. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so like, or, or Obera, is that a, a non-surgical? Yeah. Obera is one of the, um, that's one of the gastric balloons that we actually offer. And uh, that's a nice little device where you can place a inflatable balloon into the stomach and it's done with a simple endoscopy where we give you some medication to where you sleep for you know, maybe about 15 minutes. Uh -huh. And then we can put the scope down through the mouth into the stomach and directly uh, fill this with saline. And then it expands in the stomach and basically uh, maintains uh, volume so that uh -huh. you always have the sensation of a full stomach. Now, you still be able to eat, but the volume that you eat will be less because those stress uh, stretch receptors are constantly being triggered. And so those have downstream hormonal effects that actually trigger the brain and work on this thing called the gut brain axis and helps uh, your brain identify that you're full even though you didn't actually consume that much. And it's usually left in for about three months. And during that three month time frame is when the nutritional counseling and the um, behavioral counseling is taking its maximal effect. And then after the six month period, we remove it and then see how you fare from there to maintain. Yeah. And that's the biggest uh, hurdle, I think, with yeah. anything, whether it's medication, surgery, uh, or balloons or non-surgical weight loss measure. It's the, uh, you know, the behavioral changes is how do we get those? Because um, unfortunately there are people in the community who want a quick fix and they look at surgery as a quick fix. Now they're educated real quick, yeah. but um, I think resistant. it's important <laughs> to know that yeah. the reason yeah. why uh, it works is because it, it it works quickly up front yeah. and then you can let the behaviors kind of build up to that point. Yeah. I think, um, that's interesting. I, so a couple of things I will tell you, I would love a quick fix. So if that is available somewhere, I will take it. Um, <laughs> hands down. So I thought any better than anybody else, just for the record, I want it to be quick too. I'm okay with it now that I'm learning. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I am okay with it. So in terms of like the different types of surgeries, right? So we've heard a lot about, you know, sleeve versus like gastric bypass. Mm -hmm. And then you're kind of mentioning these other procedures. I don't think they do lap band very much anymore, likely because of things that have like happened with me. People have had like erosion and band slippage and things like that. But uh, at least that's what we've learned. If I'm wrong, please correct me. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, I just took out one today. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, I think it would be, I, or I was curious about is the one you were talking about. You know, these things sound really great, but like you're talking about like three months and six months and behavior changes mm -hmm. and all of that. But how often is that successful? Like how often do people not have to come back and end up getting sleeve, you know, or end up getting gastric bypass? You know, it's variable. Or on a GLP-1. <laughs> yeah, it depends on which resource you look at. I mean, yeah. the GLP-1s are great because they either they're the least invasive in, in mind. You know, you give yourself yeah. a weekly yeah. injection and then you can get about 15 percent of your body weight loss uh, with that. And it's sustainable as long as you're on the medication. The biggest downside to the GLP-1 is, of course, that when you come off the medication or becomes uh the availability drops, which has been a huge problem across the nation mm -hmm. or the price because the yes. availability right. drops and then everyone wants to raise the price because demand is so high. And the issue there is that when you have to come off of it, whether you choose to or whether you're forced to, um, the weight can come back rather quickly. Uh, then you then you merge over to like the gastric balloons and the uh, endoscopic sleeve gastrectomies. Those actually offer about 20 to 25 percent weight loss with the, um, with the medications, or excuse me, with those procedures. And again, they have a little bit more longevity of the, the weight loss staying off because there's no medications in, intertwined with them. And then when you go to the surgical, the bypasses, uh, uh, vertical sleeves or CDs, stuff like that, it can be anywhere from 25 to 35 or even higher percent body, uh, body weight loss. So yeah. there's a lot out there 
for sure. You guys are touching on that and you, you know, mm -hmm. we don't, mm -hmm. unfortunately there's a lot of primary carriers who are not a, that aware. And mm -hmm. that's been one of my big focus and regionally is to be able to educate them as much as possible to say like, Hey, there's a lot more out there and it's safe. So That's nice that you do one, that. One of the things I'll mention too, because this is something that surprised me when I was looking into getting surgery myself, I always thought that having weight loss surgery was for the purpose of just getting like, so I would eat less. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, a kind of a uh, common thought. And it wasn't until I, I think it was a bariatric surgeon. I don't remember who now, but I heard that it was an actual metabolic reset. I don't know if Dr. Fridley, if you can explain that a little bit better, mm -hmm. but I think that's a really common misconception that I know I didn't understand until yeah. going through the process. Sure. The, the process or the idea is that you can have restrictive procedures like such as like the lap band mm -hmm. where they can decrease the amount of food that you can intake. And that will help change your behaviors is the fact that you're, you know, you're consuming less and therefore that becomes your new norm. Now that's what we call restrictive and the sleeve gastrectomy still kind of falls into that as being primarily um, a restrictive procedure, but then we get into the uh, SADI procedures, OHBs, and the real and white gastric bypasses. Several different surgeries where we're actually changing the architecture of the intestinal tract so that it causes malabsorption. And that's when we get into the metabolic aspects. Then when we started digging further into the sleeve after we'd had so much success with it, we started digging in and realizing that actually the speed at which things were leaving the uh, stomach was changing the pH downstream. And that change in pH was actually changing them, your what's called microbiome, and thereby did indeed have a small effect of uh, mal malabsorption or metabolic surgery component to it. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we, we kind of think of when someone comes in the office, are we do we need to just lose weight or do we really have a, a myriad of symptoms and comorbidities that really need a metabolic surgery. And yeah. that's going to determine which surgery we, we plan for. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, I'm curious about, so in terms of like certain people that have um, gastric sleeve and then they have, or, or any of the surgeries and then they mm -hmm. have regain, is there an explanation for why that happens? And if, and when that does happens, do you ever prescribe a GLP-1 for those patients? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm, I don't know if you've had many surgeons on there who kind of challenge the system, but the, the typical dogma right now is that we, we try to do the GLP-1s early on and try to get weight loss that way before we go to surgery. And I've actually posed to the question of some of the chief scientists uh, with mm -hmm. them the uh, pharmaceutical companies to say, you know, you guys never really researched the um, gut brain axis and the neuroreceptors on how GLP-1 is acting on the brain, because I'm going to really nerd out here, but GLP-1 um, agonists are actually G ligand proteins. And those, when they go to the brain, should actually downregulate the amount of receptors you have on those brain for those to trigger. So for me, it made sense that if I did a surgery mm -hmm. that decreased those receptors because you have direct effect on GLP-1 from a sleep, let's say a sleep gastrectomy, mm -hmm. and you're affecting ghrelin, you're affecting mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> leptin levels, right. you would have a downregulation of those receptors in the brain so that if they ever did have weight regain or weight recidivism, you could hit them with a GLP-1 agonist and it would take less amount to have more profound effect. Mm -hmm. And to me, I, I, I owe it right now wholeheartedly believe that that's where I can get the biggest bang is to do a surgery on someone, mm -hmm. get them to, you know, literally throw them into the deep end mm -hmm. and say, we're going to teach you how to swim. And then when they are struggling, we can, talk about the nutrition, we can talk about the psychology, all the things that they're struggling on a piece by piece basis. But when even after that, we can still help them with the medication that'll help bring it through, you know, blast through a plateau or whatever to kind of keep them going. Yeah. 
Have you ever like given somebody a GLP um, in uh, like, like maybe they come in and they're in the five, six, 700 pounds and to like get them started and then try surgery after that, like maybe get them a better place. Yeah. You know, most of the people who come in in that, in that category are already maxed out on, they're already on therapeutic doses. And, mm -hmm. and I, that's an, a testament to the uh, pharmaceutical companies getting back out to the primary carriers. Yeah. But um, I have no problem doing that. It's just actually what's been happening is they're coming to me um, kind of already been on the medication for a year mm. and not having significant mm. results. Okay. I see that. Interesting. Um, when we've had conversations with other patients on, on our podcast about people who've had um, bariatric surgery and that food noise is gone. Um, it's wiped out for a while for them and they're, they're moving right along. And then there's a certain point that happens for them when it comes back. Um, why does the food noise return? Can you help explain that for us? You know, I can't be certain because food noise is a psychological mm -hmm. phenomenon. Yeah. And what I tend to see is between the months of six and nine after surgery okay. is when we really see this. And it coincides with typical plateaus. And okay. usually it goes around negative connotations. And this is just my perception, negative yeah. connotations of, you know, they failed so many diets before. And then when they are hit with the surgery, they have such success so rapidly that they're in the positive. Their, their psyche is very positive until they hit their first plateau. Yeah. And when That's you hit the plateau, you're like, I'm, what am I doing wrong? This is a failure. I'm a failure. We're back to the same negative cycle again. And here comes the noise and mm -hmm. here comes the bad habits again. Mm -hmm. And so usually, you know, why it comes back is different for every single individual. But I find that if you can get them in that six to nine month uh, time frame, and we typically have our nutritionists see them again, see, let's just fine tune, make sure we know mm -hmm. what you're doing. And then, um, body composition scans, mm -hmm. because I guarantee them that even though they're walking in thinking that they're a failure, it's just because of your pull on gravity. It has nothing to do with what's actually happening. I love and that. And when you put them on a body composition scanner, for which mm -hmm. they did pre-op, and then again on their three-month post-op visit, then I can show them, it's like, yes, your weight is, you dropped two pounds, but that was 17 pounds of fat but you gain 15 pounds of muscle yeah, and I can prove it. Okay. And so yeah. that's where you, I break through the psychological aspect and take I flip the script and this is no longer a negative connotation. Now you have real success and real numbers. So keep moving forward. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I love know. that your pull on gravity. That's a short, we'll be making that a short. That's <laughs> pull on gravity. Yeah, I was yeah, just gonna... definitely psychological. Like I, I can definitely um, relate to that. I, I, my life on the stall, my life between the six pounds up and down for the the whole year of 2023. But so I totally get it. Mm -hmm. I just, I just keep. Oh, hey, Sorry. Oh no, no, I was just gonna say. Speaking about that psychological piece, I know something that in the weight loss surgery community we talk about a lot too. That could be contributing to this is you know, like you said, Kim, like you don't know what it's, or this is the first time you've been in a smaller body, like yeah. for, you know, for the first time. And that's the majority of us as well, where it's like, yeah. this is the smallest I've been as an adult for sure. Um, and, you know, around high school age. And so it's just interesting because the psychological piece is still there that we're working through. And it's very, um, it's just a bit, a big process. Sorry. I'm like losing my train of thought. Dr. No, Fridley was saying okay. some, this is where my ADD, ADD kicks ADD. in. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what I thought is that once I lost all the weight that my problems would be solved. Right. Yeah. It's like, that's what I've been trying to do for sure. so long to get there is once I lose the weight, I'll be good. And I won't have any other problems anymore. And then when you reach your goal or even close to it or surpass that goal weight or whatever it is, it's kind of like, whoa, now what? Because <laughs> I mm -hmm. had never had the opportunity to get there before. So I, I don't know if that contributes to that food noise sure. piece. But that is an interesting component where it's like, now that I'm here, 
newsflash, like problems don't go away when you lose all of the weight. Yeah. There's just more to kind of sort through. And so that's something that was a harsh reality so. for me. Yeah. I sort so of also look at it. Oh, sorry. Go on, Dr. Freely. I was just say in our practice, we try not to actually set a goal weight for that reason, because what happens when you don't meet it, but you have gained significant muscle mass, you know, and everyone fixates on a number and the number has no meaning whatsoever. Yeah. It's overall health and, and that's psychological. That's, that is your weight. That is your metabolic system. But if you're coming in, you're down seven medications and I'm just scratching through your medical list of all these things that you're taking. And I was like, you're a success story, regardless of what your weight is. Right. So setting goals is always important for a day-to-day -day life. And, but um, an actual number can be dangerous. So it's like, it, it, just shoot for stuff that's off the scale. Those are the important ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I so think that's hard sometimes. I think that's hard sometimes for, for people with obesity, especially if you're on a GLP because of, like being on a maintenance dose, like the BMI is still what they use to be able to gauge mm -hmm. things. So if you drop too low, you know, then that, you know what I'm yep. saying? Like, that's the thing. And it's kind of crazy. Cause like the point is to get low and not get back up, you know, but it's hard for us. I mean, if anything, I would say that in the community on TikTok, the GLP community, people, I don't do it, but a lot of people, a lot of people, the only reason I don't is cause I'm weird. My, 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 everything fluctuates so significantly, like weight, like it, daily, we uh, pounds and pounds, you know? So it's not real. It's just arbitrary to me, but I had to weigh every day to realize that that was straight trash. But many people are like, I'm down a pound. I'm down a pound and a half. I'm down two pounds, I'm down three pounds, like every week, like, you know, so when they don't see that scale move, people panic. They really do. I see it every time. And how do I break a stall? You wait, you know? How do you, you know, the waiting table, um, you know, how do you, you know, how do you, what do you do? You just sit with it. You know what I mean? And yeah. you do what you can do. You, you know, maybe increase your calories, maybe increase your protein, but like, it's just going to happen. It's so hard. And people say, what do I do? What do I do? Cause the answer is, I don't know. Like I just kind of waited out, you know? So <laughs> where I think about a stall is yeah. um, if you're going to have plateau, that's your body fighting you doing the right thing. Yeah. That's the way to look at it. So whatever you're doing is doing the right thing and your body is fighting you vigorously like it has its entire life to yeah. maintain your current set weight, that set point. Yeah. So if you weren't doing anything, you would be just maintaining or gaining. But since you're on the losing end, your body is fighting back hard, but it has only limited resources. Mm -hmm. And eventually, if you keep on that track, it will break through on its own. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's I, that, it's the it's. It's a hard thing to accept. I remember when I kept hitting stalls and plateaus. I mean, and mine were like, you know, a few weeks at a time. It wasn't even like a real one, you know? Mm -hmm. I did hit a three-monther. Mm -hmm. That was brutal. That was brutal. <laughs> and I remember during that time, like, seeing everyone around me. It was so hard not to compare my journey, sure. right? But I was seeing everybody around me, like, uh, bam, 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 you know? And then me being, like, the same, right? Mm -hmm. And And then I remember going, okay. Like, let's just take a step back. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was like, let's just say I don't lose anymore. Let's just say, right. Would I still take this medicine forever as a sick person that needs medicine? And the answer was as long as I can get it. Right. And that's because of my inflammation reduction, the food noise reduction, my obsessive anxiety, you know, and all of these different like benefits. And then of course, with the weight loss and with all of those things, metabolically, everything, like I just was free from food. So I was like, hell yeah. Right. And yeah. so that's what it was like, you know, for me, but you have to sort of talk yourself through that, you know? And I felt like with the medicine, I could actually do those, I don't know, like mental aerobics, you know, mental gymnastics mm -hmm. where I could be like, pause and think and consider and all those things. I didn't have that ability before that my brain did not work like that, you know? And I can't help but wonder if it's, if it's just because I had this deficit, like, I don't know, I don't know the sciencey, but that's, that's what it was like for me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think as long as I'm feeling good and it's, 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 I don't care that much about the scale. I really don't, you know, the only time I worry about it is when somebody says to me, are you still losing? Right. How are you? You look great. Are you still losing? First of all, shut up, shut up, shut up, you know, but, but they're curious, right? Like, 
I don't know why we have to talk about people's bodies like that, but, but people do it. They, it's a very open for them to like discuss things, yeah. even if they're your close family. And I don't, I don't like that. That's okay in our culture, but it is, you know, people are fascinated by if you can mm -hmm. lose a lot of weight or if you're on these medicines where we have a podcast about them, you know, but in general, I don't know, like even with surgery, do you guys feel like you had that, like where you would get to a certain weight and technically it probably still looked like you were overweight where they would be like, are you still losing if they hadn't seen you for a while? Yeah, I think Rosa. everyone, yeah, I think everyone, you know, that's, I, I think that's a big part of the journey. And as you had mentioned, it's a big part of our culture, right? Yeah. Um, especially if it's a tough thing, because if people are aware that you've taken that step and the initiative to do something big like surgery or medication to get to your health uh, weight or a healthy weight or whatever the case might mm -hmm. be, whether it's a goal or not, then yeah, hundred percent. It's tough because it, it, people feel like it's free reign for them to ask things yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. Like when um, you're open about it, it's like, Oh, this is, yeah. this is free. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I yeah. guess sometimes it's tough because sure, we may have put ourselves in that position to have that discussion. And sometimes mm -hmm. we welcome that discussion, yeah. but sometimes it's not always the most appropriate question. Yeah. Um, and I was having this conversation. I went, I met with, um, the other peer mentors, um, that at, at the hospital I'm at, and we're, we're having all these discussions similar to what we're having right now. And um, one discussion we all, we talked about was, you know, with your family, right? How, how were you treated? Um, were you treated differently with your family before and after surgery, before you lost the weight and after? And I was specifically talking about one uh, experience I've had with someone um, because they were Asian. And that's mm -hmm. a big reason why I'm paired up with certain people because culturally um it's very different and mm -hmm. and so it it's interesting to see how asian families treat you before and sort of your worth and value mm -hmm. and then afterwards how that completely changes yeah. um and it sort of gets us to resent you know the people because it's just like well i still have a lot of value and i've always had that value mm -hmm. but now you guys see it so much more and it really puts perspective into everyone else around us and, and yeah. sort of the way that they feel like it's, it's, it's a okay thing to, to sort of just bring these things up. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's an interesting. It is. It's such a, a journey. It, yeah. I'm thinking of it's true. Like, yeah, it's, it's such a journey. Thing. It really is. And it's kind of never ending. Like we've had people, one, one person in particular that was on the show, you know, he has type 2 diabetes, he's lost his weight, he's kind of in maintenance, he's been doing these like shate things that we do. And he made a video and he was like, is this sort of like the end now? Because like, I don't really know. And I'm like, this is a forever thing. Yeah. Like we, I think that people forget, like you don't cure obesity. There's not a cure yeah. for it. Like it's, it's a constant thing we have to deal with. So we have to continue to support each other and be there. And we don't have to have shate videos. Like our, our journeys can evolve and be different things, mm -hmm. you know? Cause that's mm -hmm. the whole point, right? We all want to be, you know, I would say not different, but better, mm -hmm. you know, sure. like I think sick people want to get better and I think that's okay. You know, whether that's physically, mentally or both. Mm -hmm. um, so not the yeah. end for him. It makes me think of that Carpenter song. I won't, I won't sing it. We've only just begun. <laughs> oh gosh. Everybody knows that's it. Look at you one. all. That's <laughs> a good one. I caught it. I love the Carpenters. They are the best too. Christmas album ever. Oh, I listened yeah. to oh, it in like God. November. Yeah. That was Winton Marsalis for me for my Christmas album. Oh, really? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we will go on a tangent. And I'm sure <laughs> we will. Good. Yeah. Usually pop culture <laughs> tangent and it's all Kat's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't start singing Prince or else. No, do oh, start. She singing. will start singing Prince. She does it often. She'll just go, ow, out of nowhere. And I'm yes. like, yes. Oh, I like it. Okay. I, am re I am restraining myself. <laughs> You're doing a great job. Can I um, add one more little piece to yeah, that course, too? Yeah. Because I, I think one of the things that I've been surprised about too in kind of this weight loss surgery community is that diet culture still exists with mm -hmm. in that too. And so I think, you know, as you're tracking your weight, it, it's like you can still have disordered eating and disordered ways of looking at things, even after you've had weight loss surgery, that doesn't go away. Um, and so just something to be cautious of too, because it's very easy when you've been trying to lose weight your whole life 
like even for me, I've had to go, oh, I guess this is more of my maintenance mode of like, maybe this is just where my body wants to be at right now. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, usually I can track certain triggers of like the new year starting where that was always a, you know, mm. what's the next diet I'm going to do? What am I going to yeah. do? And so then I, my head gets in that mindset of like, oh, I need to be doing more. I'm not doing enough. And it's like, no, like my body is feeling really good where it's at. And, and, but it's a constant battle um yeah. even after you lose the weight because yeah your mind has been trained to think of things in that way so again somebody who's considering surgery or who's in that process like it's still hard after yeah. unfortunately yeah. i wish it was just an easy fix but it's still hard me too you gave one me thing i will say you, you, go ahead. oh sorry go ahead. Go ahead. um you know you know we we're talking about the food noise thing and, and mm -hmm. i think you know i always compare it to sort of like you know, you're a high school kid or you're at home and, and whatever the case might be. And then you go away for college and it's just like, Oh shoot. Now I have freedom. It's party time. And, and like, we are so restrictive with bariatric surgery. And then we get yeah. to a certain point where we have the ability to eat a bit more and a little bit more and we're able to exercise and we're hungrier and we're able to do more. And I think oftentimes that's when the food noise starts coming back for people. Mm. Um, and you know, whenever I talk with people who are very early on in the process, I always, you know, tell people, just, you know, it's great things. All these things are going to happen. It's great. You're getting back to closer to what you could do before, which also means that you can also enjoy some of the foods that you had previously. Like this mm -hmm. is not about you can't have anything like this. Like mm -hmm. we thought I thought that I couldn't have any any of these th foods ever again. I had a funeral sure. for all the foods that I had. Yeah, I had a last know, summer the morning period. Like, oh, my God. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like You had all that. But like <laughs> it shouldn't be about that. And, mm -hmm. and again, like if you can keep that into consideration and really look at your your sort of relationship with the food and, and work on it like I, I know I'm still an emotional eater but my thing that I do differently is if I'm having a really really like like when I hurt my back the last time I, I here I am I can't walk anymore I'm training like crazy but now I can't walk yeah and my emotions are going nuts I'm all over are. the place of course they are. and you know obviously food is one of the things that sort of come into my mind yeah. And I think it's easy to go. I know old Rob would be like, we're binging the shit out of this and it's going to go for a long time. We're going to go on a binge vacation. Mm -hmm. And and the way I sort of approach it now, because I feel like I need to allow myself to process the way I need to process. Sure. So with me, I'm just like, OK, well, I'm going to let myself eat poorly for today mm -hmm. or today and tomorrow, depending on how big the thing I'm dealing with. But then come tomorrow or come, you know, Monday. Right. I'm done. I did what I needed to do. I processed the way I need to process. I didn't run away from it. Mm -hmm. And now I'm back on track going to what my goal is. Right. Yeah, and, and I find that people, I, I, what worked for me and I know it was, what's worked with a lot of people that I, I talk to is, is don't shy away from that. Mm -hmm. Right. Like none of this is about shying away from anything or completely changing. It's, it's just looking at it through a different lens. Yeah. Right. Um, That's why it's so huge for these, you know, if you have like binge eating or any eating disorders, that they're well hidden and they can have such small cues yeah. that uh, even when you go for your psychological evaluation before surgery, they, they get missed. But, yeah. uh, um, and, and a lot of times they get missed. But that's why it's important to uh, just really get comfortable with yourself before the surgery so that no matter the outcome, you're just going to be okay. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I love what you said. That's perfect. Cause you just have to, you allow yourself to be human. Yeah. Just allow yourself, you know, this, you've spent your entire life being beaten down. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be tough on yourself. Give yourself a break. You know, yeah. you'll be okay yeah. at the end. And that, that's, that's the thing with like people with obesity. I would say like, just from what I've learned from them, you know, is that like, nobody ever gives us a break. <laughs> Like that's no, the thing. We don't like, give ourselves a break. No, the and therefore we don't. Yeah, yeah. The worst ourselves. That's so true. Um, you, you know, guys I think, answered the question I had. I was yeah. like, "What do you use when you?" Because we all have trauma. Mm -hmm. We all have. Um, a lot of us have binge eating disorder, or just you know mm -hmm. eating disorders. And so my question was like, "What sort of things do you need to kind of work on before you yeah. take I the bariatric the best, step?" The best thing to do is to own it. Yeah, own it and accept it, mm -hmm. and then basically, um, because you'll never ignore it, you'll never be able to just skip over that because mm -hmm. it'll come back at some point. Mm 
Yeah. So you just need to own it, carry it. That's your baggage. You just carry it and you work with it. Just no different than I have brown hair. Okay. Yeah. So it never goes yeah. away. Kind of, you know, don't say, oh, poof, it's magic. I'm done. Yeah. No. 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 And it's so the, the sooner, sooner that you accept it and own it mm -hmm. and say, hey, this is just a piece of the puzzle that is me. Uh -huh. Yeah. Then that's the only way that you can really make true change. Is because then you'll be happy with making small changes because uh -huh. you knew exactly where you were before. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's why it's felt so empowering to learn that sure. obesity is a disease. And that's why we're on the waiting table. We're very cognizant about framing mm -hmm. it in that way. Because mm -hmm. before I just thought I was a horrible person who didn't have self-control. That wasn't oh, yeah. true. You know, different things contribute to the symptoms of obesity. But obesity is a disease. And so, oh, that means I'm not a terrible person with no yeah. self-control. It's like, no, I, I have this disease and different things help it. Different things make it worse. And I, just because I've lost the majority of my excess weight doesn't mean I don't have obesity anymore. I will mm -hmm. always have the, the disease of obesity. And there are treatment yeah. options that if I start to gain weight again or have issues, yeah. I can look at those other options, which is so yeah. cool and empowering. Very cool. Hashtag setbound. Mm. There you go. Very empowering. <laughs> Low dose. <laughs> um, I have a I have a hot take, and I feel like because of time, we can probably end on the hot take. Mm -hmm. Let's go. So now that I've now that it, this is controversial, um, now that I have had surgery, and obviously mine is different, like it's not metabolic, right? Um, and then also now had medication that makes metabolic changes. Um, mimics them maybe is better. Um, I, I don't think there's such a thing as bad habits. I think it's just a symptom of a disease. I'll tell you why. I didn't know anything going into this. I know shit. It was a, I went to a PCP. They put me on sex tender. I started taking what the hell was going on. My butt was exploding. I didn't know what was going on. And that's because I didn't know how to take it and how to manage my side effects because I didn't have a doctor that knew any of that stuff either. Right. And so therefore there was no fear. Like I was just going into this going, okay, you know, and it's something else. Why not? It's, you know, it's, it's creeping on the next year. I got to do my diet culture thing, you know, where I figure out what diet I'm going on next, you know? And when I started to have chain things change in my brain, it wasn't about the not hungry. It mm -hmm. was that I didn't even want the things that I had used to want. I didn't have the, let me run through McDonald's and order five things and eat them all and then want more fries later. It, um, and I, I, and then also that was like, that would like be perpetual. Like that would happen because like, you know, the sugar, right? And it was the next day, the next day, the next day. I feel like I need to keep doing it until I got in the cycle. I don't do that anymore. That's not a thing. I can't change it because it it, it doesn't exist. So for me, I've been more like building on things that are just better habits, you know, maybe habits that I think are a little more positive and a little bit more um, like moving my body or finding new recipes or, you know, doing things within my community on TikTok, starting a podcast, whatever it is, right? Like just using that energy in different ways. But I really think it doesn't make sense for me. And I've had, I've, had, I've asked other people too, like, was this, do you have these habits anymore? And they're like, no. And I, I, my, my take is, I don't think that I think they're a symptom. What do you think about that? You can, you can, you can disagree. It's okay. <laughs> we do that here too. I think it's, I, mean, I kind of would agree that the, it's a symptom of what's going on. Uh, it's hard for me to pin that on purely uh, obesity though, because mm -hmm. you can see very similar situations with addiction behavior mm -hmm. and you know why do you constantly eat popcorn at the movie theater why because it's delicious you know, why do we have snacks <laughs> of popcorn in the movie theaters? it's because culture put it there yeah we've been following that dogma mm -hmm. but we've never actually said that, oh that was a bad choice that's a bad habit we shouldn't do that mm -hmm. we should be selling carrots and celery instead sure. but you yeah. know Unless you have an R and Y, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I think it's, there's there's a lot of truth to that to say that you know you're calming down a lot of the noise, so to speak, for in in basically getting rid of some of the symptoms of obesity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think it it expands farther than that. But yeah, no, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah.
I mean, it, don't get me wrong. You're sort of left standing holding the bag, right? Like all those mm -hmm. things go away and you go, oh, shit, what do I do now? Right. Like <laughs> back to what Rob was saying about like, hey, I'm an emotional leader. I am too, you know? Um, and there are times where I feel like, oh, I really, I just want to have an emotional lead. The difference is, is that I take my medicine and I, I may lean into that just mm -hmm. like Rob said. But honestly, I usually don't eat very much of it or I don't think it tasted that good once I taste it. And then I go, okay, what's next? And then usually I'm kind of looking internally or, um, you know, to think about why I'm feeling the way that I'm feeling or I reach out to my community and I make a connection and we have conversations about it. And like, just, I think that growth yeah. and that piece of it and having like being grounded in that way, yeah. that's made all the difference in the world. I think that, I think that might be the new it's, habit. I think that's the healthy so habit. Much you know? like a 12 step program. If you think about what yeah. the mission. Mm -hmm. call your sponsor, sense. you go to your meetings, yeah. you abstain, you write, you read the literature, like the, yeah. Yeah. I think there's so much awareness though, in what you're saying you do, right? Like there's so much mm -hmm. intention, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And I think that is, one of the most powerful things that we have. And I think it's one of the most yes. important things that we have in this community and realistically in life, right? It, it's really being aware of certain things and doing certain things with very specific intentions, right? Yes. Um, and which is different from something like a habit because a lot of times, whatever that habit is, is, is sort of subconscious or mm -hmm. maybe it is, but to a different level. Right. And, and, right. you know, I, I love when people are conscious about what, they're choosing to do and why they're choosing to do it and are aware of its effect on yourself, but of the other people around you. Yeah. Right. And that's sort of sure. with everything. Like that's something I try to teach my kids. Love that, Rob. I think yeah. some of it is, is the fact that maybe this medication has actually just caused you to pause and ask the one question. Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah. Why? Yeah. And then as soon as you start looking at everything that you do, it's a, you just start turning into that five-year-old again and say, well, why? Yeah. Well, why? Why? Mm -hmm. Stop asking why? that. Oh really? my God. <laughs> why? Why? I actually I'm, loved you know, that. My five year old. I loved the why stage. Yeah. They drive to school with the whys, and I was like, I, yeah. You know, why? The Lord said it shall be. That's all I can say. My kid <laughs> got an one. award at school for being the most inquisitive and the most curious. <laughs> I, I was like, that. that's, that's nice. the best. Like that. Don't you ever let me tell you different. That's the best award you can get. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will come at them. <laughs> That's how we end up with surgeries that, you know, treat obesity and medicines that treat obesity That's and, right. you I'm know, sure. cures for Asking cancer. The because question. people go, yeah. but why, you know? Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, we're trying to do here, you know, is I, I think the slowing down piece is mm -hmm. very, the pause, right. Is very interesting because I'm telling you, I guys, I swear people have been saying these things that I'm telling you I do now to me my entire life. And I could and I knew they were true, but I literally could not make the connections in my brain mm -hmm. until this medicine. Mm -hmm. I couldn't. But now I see all the things and apply all the things and do all the things. And of course, there's always fear, I think, too. And, and I'm curious what you guys think about it. And then we can finish um, of re regain, you know, like, mm -hmm. do you guys feel like even on, um, you know, even doing all the things that you do, do you feel like, well, I've always gained it back before. So eventually I will, or do you have that sort of like looming? Cause I feel like that I will see people that are getting closer and closer to like maintenance, if you will, um, that will are terrified of it. I mean, they're vulnerable and breaking down. And I I've had those moments too. And I'm curious, like on the, the side of surgery, is that something you guys have experienced? For me, I've experienced regain from my lowest weight. Mm -hmm. And so it's definitely been kind of like a mental barrier. And again, asking those questions like, is this normal? Is this right? Should I be doing this? Ah, it's easy to get kind of yeah. panicky about it. Right. But one of the things that I try to remember, and I say this a lot to myself and other people too, is that like our bodies are not statues. They're meant to mold and form and be different in different seasons. And especially for women, like, we're designed to change. Like we, we are, and this is where I'll get into, look at Rob, he knows. He's okay. like, oh, no, don't talk Here about your go. period again. Good right. God. Talk yeah. about the I, I know. know <laughs> like with, with these men, they, like they, they have, it, yeah, they have 24 seven cycles. Women, yeah, like, we're, oh, we're different every week. 
culture. <laughs> it makes me think of Talladega Nights. You're talking about the serious lady parts. <laughs> That's we right. actually have an episode of the podcast where we're talking about that, and we call oh, it I need to the serious lady it. parts. Yes, the serious lady parts. Yeah. We need to talk more about it. Don't get me started yeah, on that. We do. But... We talk about it a lot here. So yeah, you can come, you can come anytime. You can guest Thank host. You. It'll be fine. We'll have a piece of awesome. yeah, You're it. all about anytime. the period. Leave the boys behind. It'll be fine. I love it. <laughs> it would be a welcome gift. But yeah, so we're, it's like, we're not, our bodies aren't statues. We're yeah. ma made to be different. And I think that's been a good practice. You know, I haven't gotten pregnant to, up to this point yet, but that's definitely something on their horizon, hopefully. And I think it's been a really good experience to see such a big body transformation for myself to when I get pregnant and go through that experience, I'm going to be like, oh yeah, I have, my body's already had this huge transition before. Yeah. This is just a different kind of transition. And yeah. so that's, what's helped me. And again, lots of therapy and, you know, mental mm -hmm. work and all of that has contributed to it. But, um, mm -hmm. our bodies are not meant to be statues and that's yeah. cool. That's I love that. And that's a short. What about you, Rob? <laughs> um, you, you touched upon, I, I think it just comes yeah. down to perspective, Shay, right? Like, you, and, and you talked about the mental work that you put in. Like, that was sort of what I hung my head on from the very beginning, right? Mm -hmm. the, the mental work, the preparation um, that I put myself through to really make sure that this was something that was going to last for me. Um, have I experienced regain? Yeah, you know, swings of around 15 pounds ish, 20 pounds sometimes, but a lot of times they were also intentional, right? So like if I was trying to put on muscle, then I would be eating mm -hmm. more calories as a result and I would be gaining some fat with that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think my biggest thing, one of the biggest reasons I wanted the surgery was and this was my very rudimental, r rudimentary thinking back then, but I still sure. think it holds true to an extent, was I could, I could, I remember when I started CrossFit for the very first time. I don't do it anymore because my back won't do that. Sure. Um, but I remember I was with a dietitian. She's like, oh, do you know how much you weigh? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah I weigh 270. And she's like, okay. But she's like, let's weigh anyways, just so I can mark it down. And I remember I weighed in at 320 pounds. And I was like, where the hell did I get 50 pounds? Yeah. Right. And it just it. And then, you know, I had a conversation with people. I'm just like, do you remember what your McDonald's order was? I do. Because it was a double quarter pounder with supersized fries, supersized root beer and 20 nuggets. Yeah. And I was I'm in medical sales. solid order, Rob. I'm right. Sure oh, my God. I want to eat it all. But that's hmm. a great that's a great order. <laughs> right. But like. Yeah. I would have that numerous times a week. And so when yeah. I come down to it, it's like, oh, where did that 50 pounds? I know exactly where it came from, right? Nuggets. And <laughs> right. And and so yeah. one of the reasons I had the surgery was because like if I ever fall off the wagon, because I, I knew my habits. I, I asked myself, where do you excel? Where do you fail? And I know that yeah. I am an all or nothing type of guy. And mm -hmm. when I fall, I fall hard. Mm -hmm. And that's when I sort of go and I eat a whole bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. And the surgery, and this is what I was planning is, if I fall, because I think I inevitably will, mm -hmm. this will give me the opportunity to, I'm not eating a whole pizza. I'm going to eat a slice. Yeah. I'm eating two slices, right? And it's going to give me that opportunity to catch myself and say, okay, this is how you have to deal with it. And then you get yeah. back on track. And it just, and I always hope that this would give my family or friends the opportunity to give that intervention and say, hey, you got to stop. But it just worked out with me that I'm the one giving myself the intervention saying, this is how you have to deal with it. Deal with it. And then yeah. now you can move up. So I think it's worked love out it. well. And it was just that preparation for me. I love so. it. Thank you so much. That's awesome. I really appreciate that perspective. And I know that people in our community will really want to hear that, to be honest. Yeah. Like many of the people that I began with, they're they're there now you know, yeah. and they're scared and they're worried and, or a lot of people have lost access to the medication as well, you know? Um, yeah. so it's nice to be able to hear that. And I'm, I'm hoping I have had some friends like full disclosure that have gotten off the medication, continue to lose and continue to be in a good place. And a lot of them will say it's because they did the mental work, not the habits, yeah. right. But yep. the mental work that you needed to do so that when those things start to reoccur, they recognize it and can make different choices. But again, I think in an obese body and an obese brain, it's very difficult for most of us. Oh, you yeah. Know? Sure. So I think I, I I hope that these treatments will continue to progress and maybe one day our children won't have to suffer. That's the hope, right? That's the hope. 
because genetics sucks sometimes. Right. <laughs> right. Thank you so much for joining us today, guys. I appreciate that. I'll make sure to link everybody's social website, everything in the show notes. It'll be in the audio version as well as on YouTube. So, um, but I just, I'm going to, I'm going to have you guys exit and then we're going to talk behind your back. So you may want to leave because it'll get weird. So <laughs> more period talk than I'm staying. Well, no. <laughs> Not this time. You know. <laughs> well, Thank you guys. Yeah, I know. Thank, Thank you, so you guys much. very much. Absolutely. Thank you Thank so much, Rob. Thanks for having us. Have a good night. We hope Murph gets better. Thank I know. you. <laughs> right. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Aw, that was great, man. That was awesome. I feel enlightened. That was lovely, right? They're lovely. That was a yeah. great. This is a that great. Was a was, the, when we recorded it that night, this is a great evening. This it's was a great, great evening. Yeah, I feel enlightened because today was kind of ho hum meh. meh. And then, yeah, same sees. It was Rob meh. had such like sage advice and just oh yeah wise words. Doctor Fridley was. You could tell he's a very kind, kind doctor, kind surgeon. Look at you. And Shay, I'm just impressed with Shay. Shay is, isn't she? I, we have right. to have her on as a guest host. Yeah. Well, yeah, I would have them all on again. I felt the same when I was on their show. Um, they were just so gracious and kind and wise, you know. And I was just like, yeah, we gotta have one ours. Like, you know, that was super good. And and Dr. Fridley was amazing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Go see Dr. Fridley if you're in Florida. Yeah, if you're in Tampa. Tampa. Yeah. In the Tampa area. Maybe if yeah, you're in St. Awesome. Pete, I'll go into St. Pete in June. Oh, nice. And listen, if and we get we're any like the rich more awesome Oakland person Saint. to interview, Saint do Pete. not schedule during my break because I'm sick of y'all. I can't <laughs> help it when they're famous, Kat. I know. <laughs> Rosie O'Donnell. I was Rosie in Rosie O'Donnell in France. <laughs> yes. This episode likely won't come out before we do that famous person episode. So... When you guys see that we interview Lauren Manzo about lap band and JLP ones and the media and all the things, mm -hmm. yay, that'll be really good. Um, and so I keep, unfortunately, every time I turn around and I'm going to schedule someone famous, like, you know, cats on vacation. <laughs> it's not like I take vacations all the time. Yeah. I don't. I tried to do it for this week. I just want to say that for the record. I but get it. It was like, I can't. And I was like, okay. So. It's all right. It's not like I think I do all the time. I don't. Yes. <laughs> I don't. I do kind of, I'm envious of Janine's access to unlimited flying anywhere. So I know it's awesome. Well, you know, she yeah. sort of, you know, pays for it because she well, sure. works. Flies yeah. for it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Well, I think that was a really good episode. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm thankful for it and I am really surprised. I didn't know if I was going to be able to get, um, a, uh, a bariatric surgeon to agree with the fact that I said that I think that those are all just symptoms of your disease disease. I think those bad habits are just symptoms of your disease, you know, but he totally did. He was, I was hoping he was going to tell me why I was wrong. I mean, not yeah, hoping, he said, but yeah. he was like, nah, that makes sense. I'm like, Oh yeah. But I loved his like point about the pause, that pause. And that, Hmm, do I really, that's a big thing for me. I didn't have a pause before. There was no pause on Kim. You well, know? I would try to take a pause button, but you know, I was just, you know, what Rob said about losing his his weight um, and having value. Mm -hmm. um, so I've gained and lost many times, and, and yeah. Same. it's not a with my with my mom when I, when I lost fifty pounds, I'll never forget. And then it's in one of my TikToks where I was I wanted someone to see me. I wanted to matter. I wanted to be valuable to that person to my family. And when she did not say a word, when I walked into the room and I hadn't seen her and I'd lost 50 pounds, she said nothing. Nothing. And it destroyed me a little bit. Like it just, it, it, it hit really hard. So I understand. And that's mm -hmm. where I do think that's where I felt the spiral started to happen where I, at that point, regain started to happen. So yeah, I get I it. Totally get it. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, the friends and family and the opinions and the standards like that can get work. in the way. There's a certain amount of, I think, work that you do, like the self work, like Rob was talking about, mm -hmm. right? That, you know, kind of, I don't know, it just sort of gives you another layer of oomph. Like, you know, it's just, yeah. hey, you know what? That's okay. 
you can feel how you feel, you know, it's but I know okay what now. I know. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I know. Don't, yeah. I don't have to prove that I have to matter to anybody anymore. No. Like, I don't have to, but, or, or want to, you know, right. as a matter of fact, when I, I think you have seen, when I do have certain people in my life and I right. feel like that this is going to yeah. sound crappy, but they're not worthy of my friendship. <laughs> like I get it. Yeah. I I'm like, okay, I'm just going to remove myself from that. No matter how much it hurts me, because I think that I need that. I don't, I don't need that. You know, I need, I need friends that are here for me. I need and, real friends. You know, I need, I need people real, who cheer need, for me. I need people that cheer yeah. for me and clap for me and not just when the doors are closed or when no one's looking. And, you know, like I remember growing up, like I had a lot of like boyfriends like that, you know what I'm saying? That were like very much, you know, oh, I'm fine to be your friend in public. And I feel but I would, you know, like they would want to yeah. hide any kind of relationship. Like I just, I don't do that anymore. And I don't do it with friends anymore. I don't do it with anybody anymore. Yeah. You know, no, so no. you're with me in public. Up to people. You. <laughs> you, you what now? You're with me in public people. <laughs> like it's, that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, I will tell you, I don't know if it'll help at all, but like when I saw my mom, I haven't seen her in a while, um, many months and I saw her and I've lost quite a bit since she saw me last. Yeah. And she said, Oh my God, Kimmy, you're, you're so thin or you're so small. I think she said, <laughs> I'm so proud of you. Um, and gave me a hug and I didn't know how to feel cat. It's yeah, I get it. Like, and then I came in and they were like, sit down. And I was like, it's cold. And my dad was like, here's a blanket and like covered me <laughs> up with it. And I was just like, what just happened? Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? And it's not I like they did, they didn't how to take it. How do they I didn't do anything wrong? No. Right. No, okay. there was nothing wrong with anything that they did, but it was just so, I guess just other, I don't know. It's like out of my body. Like I just really, I smiling. I felt kind of awkward, but I was also really happy. And then I also felt like, wait a minute, why ain't you cover me when I was fat? <laughs> why ain't you give me that blanket right. when I was fat? Tell me to sit down. It was harder than to stand up, <laughs> right? You know? But just stuff like that. Like, I mean, it is seeing just, I'm just now at the size where I'm seeing people treat me different, you know, like, you know, men give me deals and coupons and things I didn't even ask for. You know what I mean? For, you know, just stuff like that. And, um, in, in general, Hey, I can do this for you. It's fine. That never happened to me before. Yeah. Or like, that. you know what, this is, this is, I'm not judging how, how we raised our kids. Cause we're, I'm, I'm sure. a, you know, a Gen Xer, but I remember I was carrying a huge tray into a store and there were two young men in front of the door. Not one of them helped me. Good and job. I know I was like, it's cause of a fat old lady, isn't it? I mean, right. <laughs> I'm like I've, I've, your mom. <laughs> yeah. The amount of men right. that stop now and hold that door. They, they, they but scoot ahead to hold, and I'm not skinny. They hold like, the door now. But, yeah, but they but hold the door I'm now. I'm in a more pleasant figure, more <laughs> of, I think a, I don't know appeasing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm in a smaller body. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. I think it's differently. I think I think you kind of get to a certain size and you become a little bit invisible. You know what I mean? You do. Like it'd have been nice if when I was fat they had said, "Sit down. Let me give you this blanket." <laughs> Come to think of it, I feel like my dad's probably done that once before. I, he probably did. Yeah. He yeah. probably did. That's what I'm saying. I wasn't upset about it, but I did notice the difference. That's you know, great. you know what? You go. I would tell you one. My um, one of my sisters in law, because I have many. <laughs> yeah, I, I love her to death. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh -oh. I came in. It was Christmas, Christmas Eve. It was this year. Yeah. And she said, "Hey, cat." She goes, "I'm sexy, and I know it." <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna like cat when I see you now. I mean, I've always thought you were banging, right? <laughs> But when I see you, like you saw, what did I say when I, oh, I know you had a video recently and you were showing yourself and there was, all I got called was this one picture with your butt. And I went, damn. <laughs> <laughs> she you know? danced. She's sure. like, okay, I see what you mean. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I love it. I love it. That should her. totally be like a theme song. Like if it was by Prince, that would be amazing. Oh, God. She, oh, she's a hoop. My, that's my stepsister. Awesome. My sister in law. I, don't, I have so many sisters. Well, not so many sisters in law, it. but anyway. Yeah, yeah I get that. Um, it's not that many. Any NSVs this week? Any NSV? Or words of wisdom? Oh, you know what? That's funny. Uh, this morning, walking to the cycle bar, everyone's like, Kat, you look really skinny. Like, did you lose more weight? I'm like, no, I actually gained like about five pounds, but thanks. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I feel like that's that's an NSV. Yeah, it is. Hell yeah. I gained a little weight, but I look thinner. Nice. I look thinner. Thanks. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. What's your um, NSV? My clavicles. Want to see? Yeah. 
I was trying on jewelry. You're dirty to me. <laughs> I was trying on. I was trying on um these um this jewelry for Lydia. What's that? <gasps> look at. Wait a minute. When you do that, you look so like I can't like a little kid. But oh my gosh, look at those. Look at those. That's some bones right there. You know what? When you do that's this, right, you, listening audience, you're missing out. I know. When you do this, you barely see anything. Like you don't have a chin anymore. Oh no, I got one. All, I know, but you don't it's mostly skin. That's all. So you and your um looks like you lost weight, but you gained weight. And me and my collarbones. <laughs> you want to see it? You want to see? Want to see this collarbone? <laughs> I was just showing off a necklace that Liddy gave me. And I went, oh my God, I was lit so well. I was like, what is that this? ring you got last night? The the black one, one, the first one. Mm. Yeah, that's cool, right? If it were in a, a size nine, I would still. Yeah, nine. Five. So you have big fingers. Still. I do. They, they did not shrink. Interesting. That's yeah. okay. I don't no, care. I get it. I get it. I don't care anymore. I don't care. I don't care either. I, I just kind of the rings to fit. They're not nine. Nine. No, but um nine. Be, look, I do not have skinny fingers. They are little sausages. They're long. You know, they're, they're long, long sausages, but it, but it, you know, like they they are they're sausage. I, I mine are too. Like I just I'm or they're stubby. Like I mine are long. Yeah. Here we go. whoop That's an episode. That's yeah. a wrap. <laughs> You're not alone. whoop -a. It's not your fault. Yep. Osteoplasta. Then join us on the plus sides, cracking the obesity code, the groundbreaking podcast, helping people change their lives one episode at a time. The plus sides podcast is a disruptor. We're breaking down barriers, smashing stereotypes and sharing inspiring stories that'll leave you feeling informed and empowered. Join us every week to learn from doctors who are specialists around GLP-1 medications like Ozempic, Wagovia, Manjaro. They'll provide you with science and facts to validate these incredible stories. But that's not all. We'll also bring you the voices of the GLP-1 Manjaro TikTok community, real people who face the challenges of obesity related diseases and disorders and discovered the incredible plus sides of GLP-1 medications. Our episodes are filled with heartwarming stories, laughter, and moments of triumph. You'll connect with our amazing community members who are reclaiming their health and experiencing their fullest lives. Are you ready to embark on a journey of discovery and empowerment? Tune in to the plus sides cracking the obesity code and together we'll change the narrative around obesity and end the stigma. Subscribe now on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform and join our incredible community. Let's celebrate the plus sides of life together because every story deserves to be heard. Every life deserves to shine and everyone deserves access to expert knowledge and medication. The Plus Sides Podcast. You're not alone. It's not your fault.